Mr. Bunker, all of us know of your immensely very diplomatic career, but um, I understand from your record that that began after you were about 55 years old, that you have a half a century of experience that leads up to that point. Uh, from the record, it appears that your first entry into official diplomatic work was in 1951 when you were uh, chairman of the board of the National Sugar Refining Company and became uh, ambassador to Argentina. Could you just tell us the story of that transition that you made from business life to diplomatic work? Yes, uh, Dr. Baba, I really got into <coughs> diplomatic work, government service, through Dean Acheson. He and I had been to college together. He was a year ahead of me at Yale. But uh, we'd kept in touch ever since, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he had represented my firm in some <coughs> legal work. And we had been, in any case, in close touch. And he asked me, uh, <coughs> toward the end of 1950, whether I would consider giving up business and going into government. Uh, we were having, at that time, as you may recall, some difficulties uh, with Mr. Perron in Argentina. And Dean wanted somebody who had uh, who knew the Latins, had done business with them, and who spoke Spanish, uh, to go to Argentina and ask me whether I would consider doing so. Well, I had been in business for 34 years and uh, talked it over with my wife and we decided it might be an interesting assignment, never expecting to continue uh, beyond uh, that one assignment because we'd, I'd planned to retire then and to divide our time between Vermont in the summer and uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil in the winters, where my daughter lived. So uh, I agreed to go, and uh, I went to Washington. Dean asked me to uh, go and see President Truman, talk it over with him. I did that, and uh, it was at a time time when, uh, you may recall, <coughs> uh, Dean was having some criticism in the Congress. And I said to Mr. Truman, I was a great admirer of his, Dean's, and I thought he was doing a splendid job and was sorry to see he was uh, having so much uh, difficulty with the Congress. Uh, I said I hadn't always been such an admirer of his. When I was a freshman, he coached the freshman crew and I didn't hold him in such esteem as a coach, especially when he threw me off the crew. <laughs> Mr. Truman said, how do you know? Perhaps he showed his good judgment even then. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, I decided to go, uh, went to <clears throat> Argentina, and after I'd been there a year, uh, Dean telephoned me and asked me whether I'd go to Italy as ambassador, and I agreed to do that. So. Uh, one thing after another came along, and so I've stayed in government for about 20, 28 years, actually. Uh, I think I was the oldest person to uh, uh, be accepted in the Foreign Service at the age of about 84. Uh, I, I got in without taking an examination because I'd served long enough to qualify without an examination. <laughs> Uh, had you known Perón in your no, business? No, I had never met him. <clears throat> but, um, or had experience uh, with the Argentines? Uh, only in a very indirect way through their <clears throat> interest in sugar. They have a lot of sugar producers. And that way I knew a little about the country, but I, I really didn't know much about it. And I had never known Perón or Evita, who was equally as powerful as Perón. But it was mainly then your relationship with Dean Acheson that brought you into this service. Yes. That had, had you kept up since your Yale days? You'd yes. known one another? Yeah. Oh, yes, we'd kept up. And uh, uh, he was a partner in the firm of Covington and Burling in Washington. <clears throat> and he had represented my firm in, in, legis in uh, some legal problems we'd had uh, in Washington. So we'd kept in touch right along. Uh, 
during that period, not very closely because I was in New York, he was in Washington. But it sounds as if you think he was a misunderstood figure in that period at least. Oh, I think so. I think uh, Dean Ash is one of our great secretaries of state. But uh, wasn't that the time in which he was thought to be a fancy pants uh, diplomat of the sort of uh, hyper British school? And well, uh, Dean, all those accusations. Dean, I will say, had quite a quite a manner, and uh, I think. Um, uh, it was perhaps his, his manner, as much as anything else, that uh, many, many of the members of Congress didn't understand. Or, or, uh, but I think he was uh, extremely able and had a, a, a splendid intellect. <clears throat> and uh, Dean, uh, he didn't suffer fools gladly, and he, he always let it be known. And I think that didn't help him <laughs> with the Congress. Well, what were some of the things going through your mind as you made that switch from business to diplomatic life? Did it seem to be just about the same sort of work, or was it? No, uh, not necessarily. But um, I think one of the things that came out of my experience at Yale was the obligation for public service that everybody ought to at least devote part of his life to some form of public service, whether, whether government, in government, or out of government, or whatever the form might be. But, uh, <clears throat> and I, as I had been in business, I say, for 34 years, I thought that if I was going to do something of that nature, the time had come. And I had, um, my business career had been closely associated with Latin America. My, um, in addition to <clears throat> the National Sugar Refining Company, which was my major interest, my older brother and I uh, bought controlling interests in two sugar plantations in Mexico. And uh, I had interests in Cuba and Puerto Rico. So that uh, I had had an extensive experience in dealing with, uh, with the Latins and, uh, and did speak Spanish. So that uh, uh, I thought if I were going to do this sort of thing, this would, might be a logical place at least to, to start, although I had never expected to continue in government. Those were the days in which not every ambassador spoke the language of the country he was assigned to. Isn't that the Well, case? that's still true. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could go back then to your earlier time. Uh, the record says that you were born in Yonkers, New York. That's right. Uh, was that where you were raised, basically, in, in that yes. community? Yes. Yes. Uh, that's right. Uh, my father was the founder, of the Nash, one of the founders of the National Sugar Refining Company, and uh, built their first refinery in Yonkers, which is why I, he happened to live there at the time, although we expanded beyond that <coughs> uh, uh, in later years, so that I did spend my, through, uh, through my college uh, uh, career and beginning business in Yonkers, but then uh, moved to New York because our headquarters were in New York and, and I had to be there. So I lived in New York then until I went into government. I see. Well, what was Yonkers like in those days for a boy growing up? Oh, it was a very attractive place, uh, very different from, from uh, the kind of place it is today. It was a small city, uh, interesting group of people, uh, both uh, business and uh, in the intellectual community, uh, num many professors, a good many professors who taught at Columbia or uh, New York University lived in Yonkers. I remember uh, the Scribners, the publishers, Mr. Scribner lived in Yonkers. Uh, the two Ot Bro Otis brothers who founded the Otis Elevator Company start, uh, lived in Yonkers. And, uh, uh, we, it was a city of <coughs> good many large homes and places. Our home, I remember, was about three and a half acres going down toward the Hudson River. 
So it was a very delightful place to live. I went to school first in Yonkers and then uh, to preparatory school at Dobbs Ferry, not far away. The Mackenzie School, which is no longer in existence, um, Dr. Mackenzie, who was, was a former headmaster of Lawrenceville, and found, wanted his own school and started a school there. I went there. My brother and I went there. My brother left shortly after and went to Taft. But I continued on at Mackenzie until I went to Yale. What was your What was your house like? Could you describe that for us? Your childhood house when, before you went to school. Uh, very spacious house, <clears throat> large house, with gardens. My mother was a great lover of gardens, flowers. And uh, <clears throat> we had uh, gardens and stables in the early days, of course, which were later to converted to a garage. Uh, we had uh, apple orchard, we had uh, uh, tennis court, woods below, beyond, going down toward the river. Uh, beautiful trees, it was a lovely place. What did you like to do when you were a child playing in those territories? Did you have any special um, hobbies or interests? Or? Well, uh, no, not beyond the regular sports. I played, I, I liked to play tennis. And uh, when I got to paradise school, I played football. I was on the football team and the captain of the track team. And, uh, uh, but my great love in those days, younger days in the summers, was sailing. Oh, yeah. I learned to sail when I was six on Cape Cod. When you were six? When I was six. And uh, who, who taught you that, Mr. Bunker? Well, I had to, we lived <coughs> near uh, uh, boat yards, boat builders, the Crosbys, who were very famous in those early days, end of the century, uh, as boat builders, and built the famous Cape, what was the famous Cape Cod cat boat in those days. And um, uh, it was one of them who taught me to sail, actually. And uh, uh, so that I became a great lover of sailing and kept it up uh, until I really got into government and um, sailed uh, first on the New England coast. I actually was one of the founders of the Watch Hill Yacht Club. Mm. I think that must have been about, uh, oh, I don't know, 1910, I guess, somewhere around there. And um, well, maybe a little later. Uh, and uh, then sailed. Uh, on the Chesapeake, uh, I remember the summer of 29, I had, to, I had to give up work for a year. I had some problems with my back, and uh, we were looking for a place where if I uh, were not able to go back to work, I might, uh, we might uh, retire. And uh, we tried out the eastern shore that summer, and I brought down a six meter sail there on the Chesapeake. I had a great season of racing. I, uh, I uh, actually uh, was able to do some sailing during the Panama Canal negotiations because we, uh, <coughs> we negotiated, carried on our negotiations on uh, one of the Pearl Islands in the Pacific called Contadora. There used to be pearl fisheries there and um, uh, Contadora means uh, the counting house. Uh, and uh, the fishermen used to come up and settle their accounts there, hence the name of the island. Well, the president of uh, Panama was uh, Demetrio Lacas. Um, Torrijos was head of government, but the president was Lacas, who was of Greek extraction, and familiarly known in, by the Panamanians as Jimmy the Greek. <laughs> and uh, was educated in Texas, huge person, tremendous man, powerful man, talked exactly like a Texan, you never know he was a Panamanian. Well, he had a catch. They had captured from two American drug runners, 
they put the Americans in jail and kept the boat. And uh, he used to send it over to Contadora for me to sail when I had a chance. And he said he wanted me to teach him to sail. And so he used to come over once in a while and go out sailing or fishing. So I was able to keep up with him. What, what for did a bit. you particularly like about sailing? What was its attraction? I, well, I, I liked the water. I liked the, uh, the, the, uh, the beauty of the boats, yachts, appealed to me very much, gracefulness, uh, uh, but also the, the competitive sport of, of, uh, of racing, which was highly competitive. My forebears were seafaring people, settled first in Boston, I think 1647, and then moved to the next generation to Nantucket and were whalers and merchantmen sailing out of Nantucket for many generations. My, uh, my great-grandfather was the first off-islander, as they say, and he uh, was uh, returning from a whaling voyage of two years in the South Pacific when his ship was captured by the British in the War of 1812. He spent two years in Dartmoor Prison and returned to New York and went into partnership with another captain and built clipper ships, which is how my, my father was born in New York. Uh, this is how, we, how the, the bunkers happened to leave Nantucket. I see, I see. When you were young, did you hear tales from your parents of, the, of your ancestors and their...? Not very much, no. <coughs> uh, not as much. I, I wish I'd heard more, but uh, uh, I didn't hear a great deal about it. Could you tell us then some more about your, your own parents, about your mother and father, and um, what they were like, and what they were like with you? Well, <clears throat> my father, uh, I suppose naturally I was prejudiced, but I thought he was one of the greatest men I've ever known and a very powerful intellect, uh, sense of humor, enormous wisdom. In fact, he was looked up to by the whole community in which he lived. He was head of the hospital there, senior warden in the Episcopal Church, uh, organized uh, the Charity Organization Society, trying to coordinate all the charitable efforts in the city. And uh, <clears throat> so that I, I was felt I was enormously fortunate. And uh, <clears throat> in working, going into the company with him at the time I did, I didn't start as, as youngsters start today with a very substantial salary. I think I got $10 a week, and my father said he wasn't sure I was worth it. <laughs> but um, anyhow, I, uh, I had no utmost admiration for him. And my mother, too. Uh, my mother came from a long line of ministers in the Dutch Reformed Church. Her father was a minister in the Dutch Reformed Church. Her brother, Henry Cobb was a senior minister in the Dutch Reformed Church, which is the equivalent of the bishop. And uh, going back to uh, early days of New Amsterdam, for, for New York was New York, uh, came to the, the United States by way of Brazil, incidentally. The Dutch captured Brazil one time, 1620, I think, and held it for 20 years when the Portuguese returned, gave the, uh, the, uh, the Dutch a year to leave the country or become Catholics. Well, my ancestor was a minister there in Brazil and, and decided to return. He sent his family ahead of him. And, and on the return voyage, they ran into a storm and were put into New Amsterdam. And he liked it so much, he, he decided to stay there and he sent for his family to come over. So, uh, as I say, then for 
in every generation there was a minister of the Dutch Reformed Church in the family. What was the conversation like uh, between your parents and your youth? Well, it was a very wide-ranging conversation. <clears throat> My father had a great many interests, intellectual interests, aside from his business. And uh, in fact, the conversation was, <clears throat> I don't recall the conversation being about business at home, and, uh, but about other matters of interest what was going on in the world, political developments, uh, uh, and the general atmosphere of, uh, of intellectual interests. Did they argue about religion at all? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Did they include you in those conversations oh, yes. as a child? Always. Oh, yes. We, we had always our meals together and um, until I went away to school and always when I returned, so that uh, I had uh, an older brother who died many years ago, uh, a younger brother and a still younger sister, so that there were four of us children there, and my father and mother, and we always had our meals together and, and uh, talked about everything from uh, school to political developments, and I remember uh, I cast my first vote for president in 1916. And uh, we always had the New York Times at the breakfast table. My father came down. And uh, the Times said, Hugh was elected. And my father said to me, well, it's, it's nice to have your vote, first vote count, isn't it, Ellsworth? <laughs> <laughs> By noon, Woodrow Wilson was in. <laughs> well, my... Uh, my father was, well, not an ardent Republican, but was a re usually voted Republican. So did I until, uh, until uh, Franklin Roosevelt came along. Was your father uh, devoted to Theodore Roosevelt uh, or more to the other branch of the Republican Party? Oh, th my father didn't, didn't know anything about Franklin Roosevelt. He died in 1927, or much about him. Well, I meant Theodore. Uh, Theodore, yes, yes. Oh, yes. He was quite an admirer of Theodore Roosevelt's. <clears throat> well, I get a picture of your father and of your family relationship as being one almost of awe of your father. And, and perhaps in those Victorian days, it was a rather formal atmosphere at home. Would that be well, right? Well, my father was a rather a formal person <clears throat> in many ways, uh, but with a fine sense of humor, nevertheless. But we were companions also. He used to sail with me. And in fact, uh, not only did uh, one, uh, one of these boat builders, Crosby, teach me to sail, but my father also. And, um, and we played golf for many years. Uh, really up until the time he died. And uh, so we, we, were, we had a very uh, companionable relationship, really. Uh, during that period, I remember he used to come up to New Haven for football games. Oh. And, and uh, uh, I can remember his going to Princeton with me in 1915, I guess. Uh, still, at, while he's a fairly advanced age then, mm -hmm. my father was born in uh, 1845. Oh, yes. And uh, so he kept very active and kept up his interests in, in everything, really, uh, right until the last. What was your mother like in that family setting? Oh, well, my mother, <clears throat> my mother had a marvelous sense of humor and uh, great capacity to uh, to express herself and her personality and had an enormous circle of friends because of her personality and interests and uh, uh, my my older brother uh, who was really my half brother because his mother had died when he was very very young uh, was devoted to my mother. 
and uh, she had, I suppose, as wide a circle of friends as anyone I knew, and uh, was interested in, in not only the church but hospital and all kinds of other things and intellectual uh, aspects also. She belonged to a society which called the Fortnightly Society, I remember, where everyone had to contribute a paper once a year. And, and um, she used to express some consternation about that and struggles about writing it, mm. but she did nevertheless. Uh, <clears throat> so that uh, I think we were, all of us, enormously fortunate in the uh, atmosphere, the surroundings, and uh, we had, a, I remember, a staff at, uh, at home, all, of, all the servants and everybody worked together very well. It was a very harmonious household. An interesting story about uh, a young uh, <coughs> Negro who looked after horses days before automobiles. Uh, he uh, was very ambitious to continue his education. And uh, my father helped him. He went to Tuskegee, then went to Howard University, became a doctor. The first Negro, first black, appointed a medical officer in the state of Virginia, lived in Kilmarnock. Uh, he had eight children. My brother and I kept in touch with him. He named one of them for me. Uh, he, his, um, one of his daughters uh, married a, a doctor from Richmond named Isaiah Jackson. Well, there, t when I came back from India, I went to Putney and found that their two sons were at the Putney School, where my children went to school. The older boy went to Harvard, sang in the Glee Club, produced two operas, is now associate conductor of the Rochester Symphony. And he's a grandson of, of my father's coachman. And the other younger boy is now a doctor, practicing doctor. It was quite an interesting story. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Isaiah Jackson, the father of this boy, uh, gave up his practice in Richmond and, and went out to Vietnam, served there and as a medical, a medical uh, public health director in, in the aid program. So public service was certainly no strange concept to you that you suddenly encountered no. at Yale. It was um, in the family from a long time. Incidentally, before leaving your parents, um, do you know where the name Bunker came from? Have yes. You ever? Yes. The, uh, <clears throat> the, it's, uh, the bunkers were uh, French uh, Huguenots. I went to England. The name was Boncoeur. The English, the English was anglicized to Bunker. Boncoeur with Goodhart. Boncoeur, Goodhart. Goodhart. Mm -hmm. Yes. In fact, uh, when I was in Saigon, uh, uh, some British MPs came out. One of them said to me, I think we must be related distantly. My name is Boncoeur. And he said, uh, oh, my name is Goodhart. And he said, your name is uh, Boncoeur. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. <laughs> see. Well, now, in the, with the other three children, uh, one would like to think that uh, perhaps you were the diplomat of the siblings. Uh, is there any truth to that? How did you relate to the other yes, children? Yes, well, perhaps among the, th yes, uh, uh, my older, bro older brother was 10 years older than I, so he was quite well ahead of me. Uh, <clears throat> the other three of us were quite close, and being the, uh, the eldest, I suppose, in a way, mm -hmm. I might have been uh, perhaps something of a, an influence, I don't know. He, uh, my, uh, my younger brother, very active and had a very strong personality of his own. 
and my sister was five years younger than I. So, uh, but we had, um, I think we got along very well together. Do you remember any of your adventures with them uh, in those early days? No, well, the um, <clears throat> one uh, interesting adventure was, I think, in 1912 when my father took, took the family abroad and uh, went over on the old White Star Line, uh, bought the uh, uh, Baltic, I guess it was. In those days, they landed at Liverpool. And we took, uh, uh, f then uh, took an automobile and traveled all over Wales and southern England. Had a wonderful experience there, and later went on over to Paris. And uh, <clears throat> had a very interesting, very interesting summer together. Uh, yeah. And I, as a result, I've always had a great love of England, and, and uh, I've been there so very many times. But um, whenever I get a chance, I do go over. Mm -hmm. London is one of, is my favorite city in the world. I think. I see. Well, maybe we could bring it on up to to Yale days. If, am I correct that you must have gone to Yale about 1912? Uh, I ended in 1912, that's right. Graduated in 16. My, o my older brother went there, preceded me, class of 1904, and uh, my grandfather, my mother's father, went to Yale and Yale Divinity School to graduate, so that uh, I rather came naturally by the association. So uh, I went there in, uh, in uh, 1912. Uh, can you remember your early days there? And oh, yes. Your impressions uh, of the place? Yes, very different from place from Yale today. There, was no, there were no colleges then. We all lived in dormitories. And uh, I remember first difficulties we got into was uh, fresh, early in freshman year when uh, I lived in a dormitory on York Street <coughs> and uh, somebody started throwing bottles out of the window and everybody followed and so we all got put on probation for a few weeks. Mm. And uh, oh, I, didn't, we don't, I don't think we all participated but nevertheless <laughs> we, we all got called up before Dean Jones. Mm. But uh, I think that was the only, only, only time during college career when, when my class was gotten any difficulties. It sounds as if you were one of the not guilty ones, but solidarity led you to stick I, with the uh, other. Well, that's true. I don't think I did throw any bottles out of the window. I don't know. Somebody started, and a few others followed. And anyway, the, mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that was. Uh, and you lived over on the old campus there, is that what uh, they know? The now? old campus, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, what, what made an impression on you in the, among the teachers at Yale? Well, the, we had, a, I thought we had a remarkable faculty in my time, really. Uh, English, Chauncey Tinker, uh, <clears throat> Billy Phelps, Charlton Lewis, others. Uh, freshman year, I had Chauncey Tinker, who was an extraordinary teacher, and Billy Phelps, was amazing. Uh, had a great sense of humor, too. We had uh, marked then on a scale of 400, I don't know why, but 200 was passing. And Billy Phelps two, said 200 was the ideal student's mark. It showed he hadn't wasted any time. <laughs> But we had also in history uh, Seymour, who became later president of Yale. Uh, economics, um, um, drawing, Irving Fisher, uh, people of that kind. So that we had really, I think, uh, an extraordinary, really extraordinary faculty. I think we had, as I remember, in, in languages, for example. Uh, <clears throat> I think we had a professor then 
uh, who taught language as it was later taught during War, World War II so that people could learn more rapidly. He, he made us start conversing right away. Not, I studied German for years, had a German governess uh, learn the old German script, uh, but I never became really fluent in, in speaking, writing, yes, and reading and all of that sort of thing because we spent most of the time on grammar, on reading, writing. And <clears throat> but I, uh, Spanish, of course, is an easier language to learn than German in the first place, but I learned Spanish much more quickly than because of uh, Professor Corliss's methods than, than I did German. So I think we had, a, I think I was extremely fortunate in the quality of the, of the faculty. What were you majoring One, in or emphasizing? Then? I was majoring uh, in economics and minor in history, and, uh, but took a good deal of English too. Another English professor, Edward Reed, Bliss Reed, was, another, was a great faculty. I remember one amusing incident about it, uh, uh, Reed. John Macefield came over and he came to New Haven and, and read some of his poetry. We had a big gathering in Harkness. Oh, pavilion. And um, after he finished reading, he said, I'd be glad to read any other poems anybody would like to have me read. And uh, uh, Eddie Reed spoke up and said, would you mind reading Tewksbury Road, Mr. Macefield? He said, I've read Tewksbury Road, Mr. Macefield. Mr. Reed, I'll read it again. <laughs> oh, <dear>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Well, then athletics yeah. were also a part of your life. In, yeah. but, uh, athletics were also a part of your life. In, uh, yes, uh, but before I get off the Yale faculty, yes, uh, yeah. Hadley was then president, mm. and also a very, I think, very gifted person. Had, uh, very strange mannerisms which the students used to like to imitate in way of speaking, but he was, uh, I, think, uh, I think, we're very fortunate in having him also as head of the university. His, uh, his oldest son was a classmate and very good friend of mine, Morris Hadley. Well, on athletics, I, I, I played football at school and uh, as I said, was captain of the track team then. And Weren't you a little light to play football? Well, days? no, I, I weighed about, well, I suppose 100. I weighed, college, I weighed 170, 172. I played in the backfield for about. And uh, <clears throat> used to run in uh, 100, 220, 440 yards. Uh, I, when I went to uh, New Haven, but I was very nearsighted for one thing and had problems. And my nearsightedness seemed to increase somewhat. And I went out to freshman football but gave it up because I couldn't see well enough. And uh, then I, so I switched then to rowing and uh, thought I was going to be on the freshman crew. And I say, Dean Atchison threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> Why did he throw you off? Oh, I don't know. I mean, it gets better. I, well, I, one thing, he, um, I, I rode starboard, started out rowing starboard and got used to it. And uh, something happened about the stroke. And he switched me to stroke. Well, I, I couldn't catch on to rowing, <clears throat> rowing on the other side right away. And he was quite critical of that. And I think that may have had something to do with it. Anyway, I... Yeah, I never, never got onto the varsity. Rode in the class crews. It's about the extent of my athletic performance at Yale, and uh, never did very much. Did you make some lasting friendships at Yale in those days? Oh yes, great, great many, a great many. Uh, four of us, uh, four of us who roomed together for beginning sophomore, junior, and senior years. Uh, one of them, unfortunately, is no longer living, but uh, 
<coughs> I just, on my recent trip around the world, I spent eight days in Hawaii with my old roommate, class of 1916, who has, his family had been there for <coughs> several generations, came in the, in the early 19th century to Hawaii. So, and he has been a very active, very prominent member of the community. What is his name? Hermann von Holt. Uh, he uh, very active there in uh, banking and uh, state management and that sort of thing. Just retired after 50 years as director in the First Hawaiian Bank. And um, has cousins whom we visited in 1915. I spent the summer of 1915 in Hawaii with him. And uh, he, uh, his cousins, uh, uh, one family, the Robinsons, the, the uh, Robinsons, Sinclairs, and Von Holtz came over in the early part of the 19th century. And is the Robinson branch of the family own a large part of the island of Kauai and, and all of the island of Nihihau. And we went over then in 1915, went shooting there. And, uh, the Robinsons uh, and Holtz are Episcopalians. The Robinsons are very strict Presbyterians. And uh, they have two, two sons who are about our age. So we went out together, went shooting and so forth, had a good time with them. But Mrs. Uh, Robinson, I wrote to Mrs. Van Holt afterward and said <clears> he <throat> really didn't want Herman and Ellsworth to come back again because they told their sons dirty stories. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? Well, it may be some truth in it. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, we went back there again this time after that lapse of many years and, and saw some of the same people again. And had, uh, we had a wonderful visit there. And, uh, we uh, we were together at our 60th reunion, but in between uh, graduation and uh, and uh, and the reunion, I hadn't seen very much of him. I'd seen uh, two of my other my other roommates, but we'd kept in close touch all along, and uh, so. Uh, <clears throat> And I had many other friends. I mean, it, it was a really a great experience in that way, and one that I treasured very much, and still do. Did you run into many of them in later business and politics? Uh, not in politics, no. Uh, but uh, some in business. One of them uh, was a member of New York Law Firm. I used to see quite frequently. The other. Uh, and a very gifted man. Uh, the other one um, really never got into business or much activity. He was, uh, had means, uh, uh, substantial means, and never really got uh, involved except in public things like uh, in the community where he lived near New York. And, running various organizations like the hospitals and this sort of thing. But, uh, and um, so we did, uh, we did keep in touch. And with many others who were not roommates, but uh, hmm. who were. Well, then came the war after you got out in 1916. Yes. Um, uh, I never got into the war. My only experience, uh, we had a, uh, ROTC at Yale, and uh, three of my roommates were in it. I couldn't get in because of my eyes. And uh, but when we, I graduated, June 16, I had it. No sooner got home than I got a telegram from two of my roommates saying, "Return immediately. Uh, we're going to the border to help Pershing catch Pancho Villa." So I went back to New Haven and said, how can I get in? They said, we'll get you the eyesight card and you can memorize it. So they got me a copy of the eyesight card. I memorized it, took the examination. And the doctor said, now cover your left eye and read the 
line with the arrow pointing at it, which was the normal vision. I had no trouble with that. I said, now cover the other eye and read the line above it backwards. That was a little difficult, but I got by mm. and got in. And we got mustered in to the Connecticut National Guard and sent down to Toby Hanna, Pennsylvania, for training. It was field artillery. And uh, I, uh, I was a private and a cannoneer. We had a choice of being a cannoneer or a rider. Well, I thought with a degree I ought to be able to master a three-inch field piece. Uh, became a cannoneer and discovered it was a great mistake because Sundays the cannoneers had to do stable police. And I thought in after years, what I shoveled around then perhaps was symbolic of my future career. <laughs> Shoveling out the stable. Yeah. Nice. Anyway, uh, yeah, we got to pushing for some reason, decided he didn't need our assistance. Mm -hmm. We never got to the border. And there were a lot of undergraduates, of course, in the ROTC, too. And incidentally, Dean Atchison was a mess sergeant in Company D. Same company? No, I was in Company C. Oh, same, same regiment. And uh, so had the president uh, thought, if we weren't going to the border, we're not going to have to see any active service, why, uh, they better get back to college. So we got mustered out in September. A classmate of mine, uh, Fairfax Downey, who was editor of the Yale Record, which is a humorous magazine, wrote a doggerel that began, Oh, Prexy, don't you weep, don't you moan. The money and influence are bringing us home. <laughs> so they got back and got mustered out. Then I, I tried to get into, uh, uh, in 1918, get into the enlist and got turned down because of my eyes. Mm -hmm. And I went to Canada, tried to get in there, and I got turned down there for the same reason. But it's interesting that while in 1918 I got turned down because of my sight, my two sons were in the World War II, both wearing glasses, nearsighted, but had no problem about getting in. And uh, uh, served in the infantry. And my, my oldest son not only served in Germany, but he, uh, he enlisted and signed up in the reserves and got sent to Korea. Served with the 1st Cavalry Division but always wearing glasses. Couldn't see well enough without it, but I, I, had no, I couldn't, couldn't get in. So I went to work right away, 1916. For the Sugar Refining Company? Or yes. Mm -hmm. Back home in uh, Yonkers? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, and you stayed with that then until, uh, well, really until 1951. Uh. You know, I, well, at the end of 1950, I was with the <coughs> chairman of the sugar, uh, National Sugar Finding Company. I had a, a number of other interests. I was a director in the Bankers Trust Company, a director in the American Hawaiian Steamship Company, <coughs> uh, the General Baking Company, the uh, Central Aguirre in Puerto Rico, uh, Guantanamo Sugar Company in Cuba, and a number of other companies, so that I had a fairly active uh, career in addition to sugar. Looking back over that account, listening back over it, one gets the impression of a happy life, a happy time, uh, but not much of a tragedy or difficulty or uh, uh, one might say, even great uh, challenge to the person. I, I suppose that's, that's I think that's true. I, uh, I, I was brought up, <clears throat> grew up, in what Dean Acheson once referred to as the golden age of childhood, the last decade of the 19th century and the first decade of the 20th century. When it seemed to us, those who were in, grew up in affluent circumstances, as I did and he did, that things were going to continue as pretty much as they were. A great sense of stability in the world, all shattered by the guns of August. Yes. But that was, the, that was the atmosphere in which I grew up. And uh, no, the first 
tragedy we had in the family was my father's death in 1927. And uh, my mother lived on for another 15 years in the same, same home. So, uh, but the, um, the first war, uh, the, the enormous um, death toll of that, and oh, the well. collapse of confidence uh, with Wilson. Oh, well, yes, things changed very much then, the first war. And I lost, of course, a number of my friends in the war, my classmates in the war, and it changed the, changed the world. It was never the same again. Uh, had you any personal acquaintance with people who were not affluent during those years? Oh, in college, so many, many of my classmates were working their way through, <coughs> through college. At, at Yale. At, at Yale. And, uh, <coughs> and of course, uh, in those days, too, early days, 1916, uh, there was a closer relationship, I think, between <clears throat> people who were running businesses and their employees and, uh, who were not an affluent class. A more personal interest, I remember, and, and, and uh, reciprocated in many, in, in many instances. I remember, for example, when my father died, all the workmen in the refinery then, in the Yonkers refinery, and it didn't come, we had other refineries too, but uh, who were near at home came to the house and uh, to express their condolences. And as a matter of fact, the whole sugar industry in downtown New York, Wall Street, closed down for the morning of my father's services. So we I mean, uh, but we did have, um, uh, and uh, through the work that uh, we were interested in, through the hospital, through the uh, Charity Organization Society, which, uh, say, my father organized to coordinate all the charitable work, well, we, of course, came in touch with with uh, less fortunate members of the community. Had you ever met any politicians, uh, such as any presidents or great diplomats other than Atchison before you? Uh, no, I had. Uh, president Truman was the first, uh, first president I met. <clears throat> and uh, Dean asked me to go and see him, as I mentioned, when I went to Argentina. Then I, uh, Dean asked me to go to Italy and I came back to Washington and asked me again to go and see Mr. Truman, and get my final instructions. So I went to see the president, and uh, he said, now, uh, now, Mr. Bunker, I want you to get close to the Pope. He said, uh, <coughs> I'm a hard-shelled Baptist from the Bible Belt, but these bigots won't let me send an ambassador to the Vatican. Uh, and the Vatican is very well informed on international affairs, so I want you to get close to the Pope. <laughs> well, uh, I went back, I told Dean this. He said, you'll find that's easier said than done, Ellsworth, <laughs> which, which proved to be true. But uh, I was a great admirer of, of uh, President Truman. I think in the light of history, he'll turn out to be one of our great presidents. Made, made, made the difficult decisions that had to be made. Dropping the bomb was one. Uh, the aid to Greece and Turkey, the Truman Doctrine, was another. And uh, he told me an interesting thing. He said that while Vice President Roosevelt had never invited him to attend a cabinet meeting, when Roosevelt died and he became president, he'd, he'd never sat to cabinet meeting or had any experience. He said, I changed that immediately. Mm. So now my vice president sits in at every meeting, which is an extraordinary thing. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, 
in a way, characteristic of Roosevelt. Uh, he didn't like opposition. Uh, Jim Farley, who was uh, his political manager, of course, in fact, really made him president, I think, because of his skill at organization and ability, man of great ability. I got to know very well. And I, uh, I worked in the Roosevelt 36 campaign. I was a member of the Finance Committee. But I didn't work in the third election. I wasn't terribly enthusiastic about third term, but uh, and neither was Jim Farley, but he never, nevertheless, he did organize it, of course. He telephoned me one day when I was down in my office at Wall Street and said, on your way uptown, stop off. I'd like to show you a letter. So the headquarters were at the Biltmore Hotel, and I stopped off on the way uptown, and Jim showed me this letter from the president saying, in effect, that, as you know, I would have preferred to retire to Hyde Park. And, uh, but I appreciate tremendously what you've done for me and so forth. And Jim Farley said to me, now, what do you think of that letter? But, but What that, did you say? Uh, and, and he said, what do you think of that letter? But, but to me, of all people. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the, uh, as he said, the press doesn't like any opposition. He said. Did you have some heroes, either from reading about them when you were young or from tales told you by your parents? Were there people that you especially admired or tried to model yourself after? No, I don't think so. I can't, I can't remember offhand. I <clears throat> might on reflection, perhaps, but uh, I can't think of... <clears throat> I, uh, my, my favorite author of the period was uh, Conrad. I think I read everything that he wrote, has written. Seafaring Man? Seafaring, Seafaring man. man, yes. Yes. And of course, in my younger days, read all of Cooper's, Fenimore Cooper's tales. And, Dickens and Thackeray and uh, others. Uh, I remember uh, talking with uh, Malcolm MacDonald <coughs> in New Delhi. He was the British High Commissioner and my colleague when I was ambassador there. We had lunch together one day and uh, Malcolm said, I wonder who our, who our three favorite modern authors would be. Well, we very quickly agreed on two, Joseph Conrad and W.H. Hudson. And after some deliberation, we settled on a third as Willa Cather. <laughs> so, and I was, I was always very fond of, uh, of Hudson, too, and his tales of South America, tales of the Pampas far away and long ago, and Green Mansions, and those, those books of his, and Conrad's stories. Who, what person would you say made the greatest impression on you in your young years? Um, perhaps someone you met? Um, <clears throat> no, I... <clears throat> I... Uh, <clears throat> I can't think of <clears throat> someone I met, uh, but um, I was uh, greatly impressed by Hadley, the president of Yale. And because uh, his, his older son, Morris Hadley, was, was a very good friend of mine and of my other roommates, we spent a good deal of time at his home, too. And. Uh, he, he was a very impressive person, individual, man of great attainment, scholarly entertainments, but also very interesting and very and amusing. And, and uh, uh, I think that, in a way, uh, perhaps uh, I looked up to him as much as anyone else outside of my own, except for my own father. 
and um, what did you and, specially and, admire? Uh, and my uh, uh, another person who had, I think uh, I I admired liked immensely was my uncle uh, Henry Cobb, who was uh, as I said senior minister in the Dutch Reformed Church, <clears throat> and had a church in New York at the time. But um, other than that, I can't think of anyone particularly that I knew who, who left such a lasting impression. Thank you. Our time is up. Thanks so much. Uh, I've enjoyed it. You've, you've revived many memories that I hadn't thought about for a long we time. Have.